Hello, my name is Dr. Paola Romero. I am a philosophy teacher at Harris Westminster and I'm delighted to welcome all of you to our school as the next incoming cohort of year 12. And I want to use this video as a way to excite you and to invite you into the world of philosophy. If you're thinking of taking this subject or if you're just interested in the idea of thinking philosophically or thinking about philosophical questions, well, stay around a bit and, and just listen to some of the things I would like to share with you today. I've been working on philosophy for many years now and it is very hard to come to a definition of what philosophy is about or the things that philosophy is interested in, for example, in contrast with other subjects such as mathematics, history, um, the sciences and the natural sciences in general, or also the arts like theater or literature or poetry. Philosophy definitely has something distinct to it as a discipline and as an object of study. And it's the fact that it is an inquiry into the fundamental nature of things. I know that all sounds very abstract, but philosophers have been very keen in trying to decipher the world around us. It is no wonder that Aristotle said that philosophers are prose to children when they're very, very small, because they have this delight and this wonder to learn and the quest, you know, when you nagged your parents and said, but why, but why, what does this mean? Where are we going? How long is it going to take? Those are this kind of questions that have this childish, but at the same time, this deeply philosophical character. I want to use this lecture as a teaser to what it would mean to study at Harris Westminster and to join us in our community. And I want to divide this presentation in two parts. The first one has to do with how to do philosophy, just like we learn to build a bridge or we learn to give very good speeches in parliament. Philosophy also requires certain skills and it requires a know-how Lear to learn how to do philosophy. I'm going to deal with that first. And the second part is what are the proper questions philosophy is interested in? This, the first one is the question of the practice of philosophy. And the second one is the question of the scope of philosophy. Imagine that we're tracing the limits of a country. What are the limits of philosophy? What's the thing that distinguishes from other disciplines? So to the first question of, if you're interested in doing philosophy, imagine you come into Harris Westminster first day, you bump into me, your philosophy teacher, Miss Romero, and say, well, Miss Romero, how, I, how can I do this? This seems to be beyond me. I have no points of reference. So I thought that a good way of thinking about it is by looking at this very famous drawing by Raphael. He was a painter of the Renaissance in Italy, and he drew this very, very famous drawing of the what he called the School of Athens. And at the center of the School of Athens, let me find you a detail for it. We find, you know, the two, the two big guys, like, I don't know, think about someone in sports or something, you know, the, the really important guys. And they were Plato and Aristotle. You have Plato wearing a sort of red gown, and you have Aristotle wearing a blue gown. And the thing that is interesting is to see their gestures. Raphael was interested in conveying, in painting, two different worlds of philosophical um, theories. You see that Plato is pointing up with his finger up. And where is Aristotle pointing? He's pointing forward. He seems to be pointing at the world, whereas Plato seems to be pointing at the heavens or the stars. And I think that this is a very good way of thinking how philosophy has two strands. One of them is the questions of 
Why are we here? The big questions. Why are we here? What is the nature of the world? What is the meaning of experience? The meaning of life? Aristotle was saying, don't look up. You won't find the answer up there in those very complicated and abstract theories. If you want an answer to the meaning of life, look down, look around you, look and listen to the people around you. I don't mean that these two ways of doing philosophy by thinking about abstract arguments, definitions, logic, that would be Plato's way, let's say, or Aristotle's way, thinking about questions about practice, about well-being, about even about politics, that's Aristotle's way. I don't mean that these two things are incompatible, but definitely there were two canonical ways in which to understand the discipline. Plato was a professor, a teacher of Aristotle in the academy. That's possibly where they are here. And Aristotle, as all students should be, raised um, quite you know, difficult challenges to his teacher and said, I think I'm going to go the other way. So in a way, Aristotle has something of a rebel in him, but a rebel that was able, able also to incorporate what he learned from Plato and put it to work in a different way. So back to Raphael, I said that I was interested in the question of how to do philosophy. We have already seen in the relationship between Plato and Aristotle, a relationship between a teacher and a student, is that philosophy is about learning. It's about learning how to address arguments and philosophical problems in conversation with someone that has some sort of expertise. So the philosopher is that who has expertise over philosophical questions, such as, let's think about a classic one, what is the good life? Whereas um, a mathematician has the expertise of the theory of numbers. So in the same uh, Raphael drawing that I was telling you about, by the way, this is, this is um, a painting that is in the Vatican, and this painting was precisely at the top of a very beautiful room, and that was the library of the popes where they kept their philosophy books. I said there are different ways of doing philosophy, and all of those ways are present in this painting. One of them is like this. You can see that there is someone holding the knowledge. You see the little blackboard here and the book. And then there are these guys at the back and that might be a woman. Some people think this is a woman, which would have been great. They are at the back looking over his head, trying to learn, copying, making copies, working really hard. That's something that we as philosophy students are meant to do. We're men me meant to, as they say, to stand in the arms of giants. And we're meant to first, and this is something we are going to do at Harris Westminster, is to read the text very carefully. The text is not dead or silent. The text is, an, is like an organism that is alive, that speaks to us. And we're going first of all to learn how to read those texts because we have to get used to a different language, to a different way of reasoning. And this is one way of doing it, by looking at those that have done it before us and that have done it well. Philosophy is primarily interested in good arguments, in showing the entailment of good reasoning, and in showing also that the, the things that we think are based on what they call universal principles or in um, big statements that ground the premises in which we, we base our arguments. Another way of doing philosophy, and this one I like particularly, is this way. Look at that group of students. They're all concentrated on this sort of also sort of blackboard. They're all engaged together in trying to decipher this problem in common. 
And I think that this is a great way of doing philosophy because it invites us to do it collectively. How? By debating. Philosophers were very well known of being good speakers and debaters. Why? Because you need to show that you can stand behind a position, not because you want to be dogmatic. So imagine that you want to commit to the view of Descartes, according to which there is a difference between the man and the body, what we call do mind-body problem or dualism. If you want to defend that position in an essay, for example, you have to give good arguments. You want to give evidence of what's the case. You definitely have to give definitions. What is the mind? What is the body? How does Descartes characterize them? How does he differentiate between them? And once you've done all that and you've come to a position that you can hold and you can hold with strong arguments, you can debate them with others. Because if you look at the history of philosophy, most philosophers were in constant conversation with one another. Just as I said at the beginning between Aristotle and Plato, Aristotle came back to Plato and he had a view against Plato's idea or theory of the forms, something we'll definitely study at Harris together in our classes on philosophy. So philosophy moves by an endless conversation, a back and forth of arguments and a back and forth of a, a debate about the fundamental questions, about ethics, about politics, about a theory of knowledge, about epistemology, that is, the theory of um, knowledge and belief. But it's not just all debate and close acquaintance and understanding about the text. Philosophy has a lot of this. What do you see there? You see a man on his own thinking really hard. You know, you sort of feel he's sweating there. And that is also an important aspect of philosophy. That is a time for self-reflection. And this connects with a very important person that I haven't mentioned. And his name was Socrates. I don't know, it's funny that all these Greek guys didn't have, you know, they just have a name like Shakira or, um, you know, I don't know, Beyonce. They never have surnames. It's very funny. Socrates was a teacher of Plato and, of course, by continuity, a great influence in Aristotle and the, and the, the rest of the tradition. Socrates got into a lot of trouble in Athens because he was educating precisely students like you, young students eager to learn philosophy and also eager to look at the world around them and say, mm -mm, there's something wrong here. They saw injustices, they saw structures that they thought were not just, were not right. And what did they want? To think, to think freely. And Socrates said, that's exactly what you should do. Of course, that got him into trouble with the authorities and he ended up having a trial and, well, he ended up dying. I won't tell you the end of the story, you should read it yourself in his apology, which is this text that's his defense against the Athenian Senate or the, the Athenian um, politicians. And Socrates, if you ask me, why was Socrates condemned to death? He was condemned to death because he thought for himself. Remember, as I said, one of the ways of doing philosophy is by self-reflection, that is inquiring into yourself. Who am I? Am I being the best person that I can be? Am I giving all that I can give to my society and my community and those around me? Am I understanding reality at its core? Am I engaging and committing fully to a life of knowledge and to a life of well-being and a life based on ethics. Those were the questions that interest um, Socrates. And this is the famous, um, maybe you've, you've um, come across this, that famous phrase of, I know that I know nothing. Well, it was Socrates who say that. But the important thing that some people don't say is that he says, 
I, I know that I know nothing. It's not only that I, I know nothing, which would be, well, what is there to be proud about of being ignorant? But the twist comes when you say, I am aware of the limitations of my knowledge. I am aware that even if I try and I try, there's always more than we can learn. And at Harris Westminster, I believe that that's the spirit. We want to make students aware that they can learn more, that they must learn more, that the world of knowledge is unbounded and unlimited. And we will do so, surely in philosophy, by debating, by confronting on ideas, by really committing to what we learn, but also by knowing that we don't know it all. And I think that is very important. I said that the second part of my talk would be dedicated to the questions of philosophy. Of course, if it's, this is a discipline that asks more questions than the ones that it can actually answer, you can imagine that it's unbounded and unlimited how many questions it asks. But one of my favorite philosophers, the one I work very closely and I did my PhD on him, is Immanuel Kant, a German philosopher from the 18th century. Kant wrote that philosophy is interested in three fundamental questions. What can I know? What ought I to do? And what can I hope for? You can see that these three questions, in a way, map out the different areas of philosophy. One big, a big one and, and very important one is the question, what can I know? And that is the question of the theory of knowledge. That is the question of epistemology. And that is the question of the what and the why of what I know. The so-called pre-Socratic philosophers before Socrates were interested in knowing what is the world made up of. One of them decided that the world was made all of water or that the world was made of air. Then another one came around and said, mm, gotcha, I have a better answer. The world is made of the combination of the four elements. Of course, you could think that these talking about what things are made of seems to be a question of science. Then philosophy has a different approach to those questions. We might not get the science right, but we do show that in knowing what things are, we also raise the question of the purpose of things. If we ask, what is, why is it important to know, for example, what are the limits of what human beings can know? Can we know things that we cannot talk about? Can we know things that we don't even have concepts for? So you can see how you start raising the question of the purpose of the inquiry and the inquiry in se itself becomes interesting. To put you an example of those questions, in, the, in talking about Kant's first question of what can we know, Bertrand Russell in his fam famous The Problems of Philosophy, and I find this book a, a bit, mm, look at the cover, I wonder if our brain looks like that. So Russell says, raises questions like this. Is there any knowledge in the world which is so certain that no reasonable man could doubt it? Tough one. Is there any knowledge in the world which is so certain that no reasonable man could doubt it? He's really saying, well, is there something that we could all agree on? You can already see the ethical and political implications of this. Could there be something that no one could doubt about? Fascinating stuff. He later said, asks a different kind of question. He says, the question we have to consider in this chapter is, what is the nature of this real table which persists independently of my perception of it? And this connects with a strand in, in philosophy called the theory of, of idealism which says, in some of its versions, for example, and, and it is worried about the question, okay, well, we're not looking, do things stop existing? When I shut the door of my studio at night and go to bed, where do my books go to? 
How do we know that the world is there even if we're not looking at it? Behind that is the idea. There are two important implications there. The first one is that things exist to the extent that we perceive them. Hence, we are the center of the world because we are the ones that give existence to it. If we're gone and gone in a Telsa COVID rocket out to space, the world doesn't really seem to have much meaning. That's an implication, and that's not obvious at all. And a second one, for example, if you're interested in God, and these guys were, and these when this sort of questions were first phrased is, well, maybe if we don't see them, God sees them? So the idea of God, the perceiver, or God as the ground of the stability, both of knowledge and the, of the existence of things, comes from questions like this. Another difficult Russell question, let's see, classic philosopher, listen to this one. Let us take an illustration, L let us take as an illustration a matter about which none of us in fact feel the slightest doubt. Do you remember what the first question about, can we find something that everybody would agree? Okay, apparently this one no one doubts. We're all convinced that the sun will rise tomorrow. That's the thesis. Why? Is this belief a mere blind outcome of past experience? Or can it be just defined as a reasonable belief? So Russell is here interested in, in two questions. Of course, he is problematizing something that we think, and that's classic philosophy. We take something for granted, something that we all take for granted. The sun will rise tomorrow. And problematize and said, wait a second. Why are you saying that? Is that based because you think it's reasonable to think that that will happen? So it's your expectation of how the world should be. It is reasonable that it will rise tomorrow. Or, as he says here, is it just best based on past experience? Do you think it will rise tomorrow because it did yesterday? Tricky. But don't worry, we'll have plenty of time. Um, at school to deal about these things. Remember the two other questions of Kant. We've done, what can I know? The question, the second question, and this one is the one I'm most interested in because I work on Kant, is what ought I to do? Philosophy has an en enormous ethical dimension in asking questions about the difference between the good, uh, not the difference, but let's put it positively. What is a good action? What gives moral worth to an action? How do we know that certain things are just utterly wrong? For example, slavery. Slavery surely was an appalling practice, practiced for many, many trillions of years, and sadly, even today. But we just know it's wrong. A bit more like what Russell said. Is there something that we can know with absolute certainty? I think that we know with absolute certainty that using another human being as a means and not respecting their dignity is wrong yesterday, now and tomorrow. How can philosophy make that claim? The third one is what can I hope for? And this is the question mostly about not only about the afterlife, questions that touch upon the areas of theology, for example, what do we, where do we go to when we're not here? Or what if we are a combination of mind and body? As I mentioned in Descartes' dualism, Descartes was necessarily interested in the question of what happens with the mind when the body perishes. But even if we don't have a clear view or an interest in the afterlife, the question of what can I hope for is important also for the now. For example, what can I do now as a year 12 student living in London and going to school to make my world a better place? Maybe the world won't be the best place whilst you are around, but you can hope that it will be a better place for those that come behind you. As I said, my name is Dr. Paula Romero. I'll be pleased to teach you at Harris Westminster and I'm very happy that you will join us in philosophy. Thank you very much.